Today I have five cases for you filled with deceit, lies, and of course, surprises. Each case is more shocking than the last, but I've saved the biggest twist of all for the end. In 1999, 42-year-old Mark Dribben was employed as a United Airlines cargo worker at Portland International Airport. On July 2nd, Dribben called into work to ask his bosses if he could take the night off because he was dealing with what he called a personal emergency. Not thinking too much of it as it was a perfectly reasonable request, his boss agreed. But this seemingly normal call was the last time anyone heard from Dribben. Investigators looking into his sudden disappearance were disturbed by the scene they found at Dribben's apartment. Inside, they found evidence that some sort of struggle had taken place and multiple items were missing from his home. For one, his car wasn't there and only showed up two weeks later when it was found abandoned in an area that Dribben wasn't known to visit. All of this was very mysterious, to say the least. However, even if investigators weren't sure exactly what had happened to Dribben, perhaps a robbery gone wrong or a fight, there was still hope that whoever else was involved, they would be identified. Investigators had found DNA evidence from someone else in both Dribben's apartment and car. The once promising lead fizzled out as quickly as it was discovered when the DNA sample failed to find a match. At this point, police were starting to suspect that Dribben had likely been killed, but they never found a body and soon his case went cold. For close to two decades, there weren't any answers, with Dribben's family and friends long since losing hope that they would ever have satisfactory answers. That is, until 2019. As we've recently seen with many cold cases that have DNA evidence, matches can pop up years later when family members of suspects submit DNA to public genealogy websites. Investigators had taken the suspect's DNA in Dribben's case and submitted it to a third-party company for forensic analysis. They soon learned it could be connected to a family, and specifically one of several brothers. Police then narrowed that lead to 53-year-old Christopher Loverin and obtained a search warrant to get a DNA sample from him. Prior, Loverin had never been considered a suspect in the case, but it came back as a match. Very few details have been released about Loverin, though it's believed he had worked at some point in Twilotten at a metal fabrication company. Loverin was arrested and several weeks later in May 2020, investigators decided to search his property, hoping that they might finally recover Driven's body. Even all these years later, it was during the search of Loverin's shed that they stumbled upon something alarming. It was a body. Now, being as they were looking for a body, this shouldn't have been a shock, except that this dismembered body looked nothing like Driven. Beyond that, Dribben had been missing since 1999, and his remains would have been highly decomposed or even mummified. But this body couldn't have been dead for more than a few months. There was only one answer. Investigators had gone looking for one body and accidentally discovered another, killed 20 years apart. The body belonged to Kenneth Griffin. He had last been seen alive three months before his remains were found in the shed. Lovren's charges were doubled from one case of second-degree murder to two. As well, he was charged with one count of abusing a corpse in Griffin's death. Driven's body has still never been recovered. What may be strangest of all is that both of the killings appear to be random, and there's no known connection between any of the three men. Even though police had once suspected Driven knew his killer, given his phone call into work, depending on the outcome of Lovren's trial, there's a chance he didn't. Loverin has pleaded not guilty and, as of this video, he is awaiting trial. Currently, investigators are trying to determine if there may be any more victims. They suspect there may be because of undisclosed suspicious evidence they found at Loverin's property. Since they stumbled across one body, who knows what else may be out there to find. Though the result of Dribben's case is not yet known, this next case has come to a conclusion, though I doubt you'll find it any more satisfying as it is nothing short of tragic. In the mid-1980s, Patricia Stallings was working as a convenience store clerk in St. Louis when she met David. The two started dating in 1986 and were married two years later. Just one year after tying the knot, they welcomed their first child, a son they named Ryan. At first, the couple couldn't have been more overjoyed, but tragically, just two weeks after he was born, Ryan started showing signs that something wasn't quite right. Ryan began struggling to breathe and vomiting. His rightfully concerned parents rushed him to the hospital, where he was admitted into the pediatric intensive care unit. Ryan's symptoms were strange. 
Doctors ran every single kind of test, but when they checked his blood, the test results only raised more questions. It appears that Ryan's blood had elevated levels of ethylene glycol. Horrifically, one of the explanations for this elevation was that it was caused by antifreeze poisoning. Obviously, the doctors caring for Ryan were worried that this was the case and went to the police to share this concerning information. Until an investigation could determine the cause of his illness, Ryan was put under protective custody. After two weeks in the hospital, Ryan appeared to recover and was released. Rather than return home with his parents, he was turned over to the custody of family services. Still, Patricia and David were allowed to visit Ryan every Thursday, and they continued that way for three months. Then they saw him on August 31st for what seemed like a regular visit, but only four days later, Ryan was once again hospitalized. Police arrested Patricia the very next day, and she was charged with assault under the assumption that during her last visit with Ryan, she had once again poisoned him. Two days after her arrest, Patricia was told her son was dying. Doctors treated him for ethylene glycol poisoning, but it wasn't working. Tragically, Ryan died soon after. Patricia was charged with the death of her five-month-old son. A bottle of antifreeze was found by the police in the Stallings' home. Patricia adamantly denied that she would ever harm her baby, never mind kill him. But despite this, she wasn't allowed to attend his funeral. No matter how much Patricia proclaimed her innocence, no one could explain Ryan's blood test results or the strange circumstances surrounding his death. So when the case went to trial, Patricia Stalling was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Unknown to both Patricia and her husband, she had been once again pregnant at the time she was charged. Patricia ended up giving birth to a second son, who she named David Jr. while behind bars. Of course, Patricia was in prison for the death of her first son, so this baby was immediately taken away from her and placed in foster care. Not that she could have kept custody while incarcerated. In fact, she was only allowed to visit her second son on two occasions and was never alone with him. Yet, soon after he was born, it was clear that there was something wrong with this baby as well. He was listless and refused to eat, similar to the same symptoms that Ryan suffered from before his hospitalization. He was rushed to the hospital, and it must have felt like deja vu for the parents who had just experienced this same horror the year before. But unlike before, David Jr.'s test came back with the diagnosis of methylmalonic aciduria. Methylmalonic aciduria is a genetic disorder that created excess propylene glycol, but not ethylene glycol, as was found in Ryan's blood tests. David Jr. was treated with vitamin B12 doses and recovered completely fine. Patricia's defense attorney argued that due to the similarities in their symptoms, Ryan had actually been suffering from methylmalonic aciduria just like David Jr., but unlike his brother, he had been misdiagnosed. The two types of glycols are very similar, and it wasn't out of the question that they could have been mixed up during lab testing. However, it wasn't until Patricia's case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries that any real answers came to light. A biochemist saw the show and decided to get involved. He tested the blood sample from Ryan and passed the results over to Dr. James Shoemaker, the director of the Metabolic Screening Lab at St. Louis University. He concluded that Ryan had also suffered from methylmalonic aciduria. In July 1991, after Patricia had spent 14 months behind bars, she was released while she waited for a new trial. By September, the case against Patricia was dropped and it was officially ruled that she had been wrongfully convicted of her son's death. The same day that the Jefferson County prosecutor personally apologized to Patricia, David Jr. was returned to his parents' custody. Patricia and David sued the labs who confused Ryan's test results and the hospital. They came to a settlement of several million dollars. However, in another tragedy, this case doesn't have a very happy ending, as David Jr. died in 2013 at only 23 years old. On April 28, 1997, Celeste Nurse gave birth to her daughter Zephanie in Cape Town, South Africa. Celeste and her husband Mornay were overjoyed. They had their nursery ready and set up, decorated in blue, yellow, and white. The only thing that was left was to take their new baby home. For three days after Zephanie was born, Celeste held her, forming that special bond between mother and daughter while the couple waited for permission to take her home. But then something went horribly wrong. 
On April 30th, a woman dressed in the hospital's nursing uniform took three-day-old Zephanie out of Celeste's room. Celeste, a bit drowsy from pain medication, just assumed that the person was a maternity nurse. Why else would they be wearing the colors of the nurse's scrubs? But sometime later, when she was woken by another nurse, there was no sign of Zephanie. The nurse asked Celeste where her baby had gone, and Celeste told her about the other nurse. She was horrified to learn that the hospital hadn't sent anyone into her room. There was no sign of Zephanie. Still, there were some clues left behind, including a pillow found discarded in a tunnel through the hospital that led from the maternity unit to a road just outside the hospital. You may be wondering why a hospital would have a tunnel that someone can use to flee after stealing a baby. I know I was. Well, the hospital says that the tunnel was designed to help connect to the hospital's old main building, to the psychiatric department and the outpatient section. But in Zephanie's case, it was used for her kidnapper to vanish without a trace. After Zephanie's disappearance, the tunnel was understandably closed. As more clues emerged, one thing became abundantly clear. Whoever took Zephanie had planned the kidnapping down to every detail. The pillow found in the tunnel had likely been used to fake a pregnant belly because no one would question why a pregnant woman was in the maternity ward. They had also worn a uniform which matched the maroon pants and oatmeal top the nurses wore. It was also revealed that another mother had woken to find the alleged kidnapper holding her baby. When she asked her why, the woman was friendly and said that the baby had been crying and she was comforting it. It seemed like she had gone to the hospital to take a child and she didn't care which one she took. All of this information didn't help to reveal who took Zephanie or where they'd gone. The police were called, but they didn't come up with any leads. Celeste and Mornay were distraught but were told that investigators would keep looking for their missing baby. They were sent home without Zephanie. The story made headlines and the public helped to find a few strong leads at first. One concerned citizen called the police to say that their neighbor, who they hadn't seen pregnant, now had a baby, but it turned out the child was a boy. Another instance in 2009, someone called and said they knew about Zephanie's whereabouts, but wanted to be paid for the information. Mornay even wore a wire to meet up with the informant, but the person never showed up. For an agonizing decade, the nurse family were tormented by false leads like this, but Zephanie was never found. Since Zephanie had disappeared, the nurse family eventually had three more children. All of the children look a lot alike, something that has let the nurses imagine what Zephanie may have looked like. This story then took a strange turn. In January 2015, school started for the Zwanswick High School in Cape Town. For a 17-year-old girl named Miche Solomon, it was her final year of school. It seemed like any other first day, except that throughout the day, other students kept telling Miche something odd. One of the new students, a girl three years younger than her, apparently looked just like her. At first, Miche thought it was weird, but not that interesting. After enough kids commented on the striking resemblance, Miche decided to have a look for herself and met up with this other girl in the corridor of the school. Instantly, Miche felt like she knew her. The younger girl, Cassidy, also took an immediate liking to Miche. The two became fast friends, spending a lot of time together. Miche would call Cassidy baby girl and she would call her big sis. People still commented on how much they looked alike and they would even make the joke that they must have been related in another life. Miche and Cassidy took a selfie and went home to show their families the new friend they'd made. Miche's mother, Lavona, said that the girls looked quite similar, while her father, Michael, said he recognized Cassidy from the electrical store her father owned. They thought the similarities between the girls were interesting, but nothing remarkable. Cassidy's parents had a very different reaction. You see, Cassidy's parents were Celeste and Mornay Nurse, and they couldn't stop staring at the other girl in the photo with their daughter. They told Cassidy to ask Mache if she was born on April 30th, 1997. When she did, Mache said, Why are you stalking me on Facebook? A few weeks later, Mache was called to the headmaster's office during class, where two social workers were waiting to speak to her. They told her about a baby girl named Zephanie Nurse, who had been abducted from the hospital 17 years ago. They told her that she may have been that baby. Mache was sure it was a mistake, but agreed to take a DNA test. The result shocked her. Mache was actually Zephanie Nurse. Her true identity had only been uncovered by her chance friendship with her biological little sister and a selfie. 
For Mache, her entire life was turned upside down. She wasn't allowed to return to her home and was placed in a safe house. The woman who had raised Mache and who she believed to be her mother was arrested and charged with kidnapping and fraudulently claiming to be the mother of a child. Michael Solomon was just as shocked. He had believed Mache was his biological baby. 17 years earlier, Lavona had been pregnant, but police believed that she hid a miscarriage and faked the rest of her pregnancy before she stole Zephanie and brought her home as her own child. The nurse family, on the other hand, finally had the happy ending they never thought they would see. As it turns out, Mache had been raised only three miles from her home. At her trial, Lavona Solomon denied any wrongdoing, and the judge even commented on her lack of remorse. But despite this, she was sentenced to 10 years in jail for kidnapping, fraud, and violating the Children's Act. Today, Mache still struggles with the turmoil of this revelation. She may have two families, but the circumstances of her kidnapping have left her with a fractured relationship with both. She has, however, perhaps surprisingly, chosen to keep the name Mache Solomon, who she was raised as rather than the one with which she was born. Moving on, our final two cases go hand in hand, as both seem like they have fallen right out of the pages of a spy novel, except they are both shockingly real. Georgi Ivanov Markov was an author and playwright in the 1950s and 60s, known for his critical writings about the communist regime in his home country of Bulgaria. Some of his more outspoken works ended up being banned, but despite this, Markov found success. Still, as you can imagine, the Bulgarian government wasn't particularly pleased with Markov's criticism. Eventually, in 1969, Markov decided to defect and flee to the West, where he moved to London, England. On September 7, 1978, 49-year-old Markov was headed to work across London's Waterloo Bridge when something only slightly out of the ordinary occurred. He waited for the bus to his work, just as he usually did. Nearby, a man holding an umbrella. It wasn't an unusual sight, this is England after all. But as Markov is standing there, he feels a small yet sharp pain in the back of his thigh. The stranger is bending down to grab the umbrella they have just dropped. He heard the stranger mumble something like an apology, possibly in a foreign language. Without thinking much of it, Markov saw the stranger hurry across the street and get into a taxi. By the time Markov got to work, he noticed that the back of his thigh was still stinging, and the initial pain there had diminished at all. He checked his leg and found what looked like a small red pimple. It was all a bit odd, but nothing imminently concerning, that is, until later that night. By that evening, Markov was experiencing a fever so severe that he went to St. James Hospital in Balham. Over the next few days, Markov's health continued to rapidly decrease. Only four days after being admitted to the hospital, on September 11th, Georgi Ivanov Markov died. Officially, his cause of death was from septicemia, which, if you don't know, is a form of blood poisoning. But before Markov died, he told everyone around him, including his doctors, that he thought he had been poisoned. Poison would account for his quick decline, and he even knew already who had done it. Markov believed that the Bulgarian authorities had been gunning for him just before his untimely death. This claim was a bit hard to believe. It would mean that he had been assassinated, and that is no small accusation. It was especially doubtful given that Markov had been in poor health before he died and suffered from kidney trouble, as well as co-workers knew him as paranoid and on edge, and the claim that he was poisoned fit with his previous behavior. According to these co-workers, Markov would occasionally lock himself in his office or refuse to eat food at friends' houses. Yet Markov was convinced, and he even knew exactly how he had been poisoned. In one of the more bizarre methods of poisoning, Markov was sure that when the stranger bumped into him in the street, it had been the tip of the umbrella which poisoned him. Markov's suspicion about the poison umbrella was not entirely impossible, and soon the special branch and Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist squad became involved in trying to determine exactly how and why he had died. First, they had to prove that he had in fact been poisoned. Different theories were thrown around, with one doctor speculating that Markov had been bitten by a venomous snake, or that he had been poisoned with jelly rubbed onto his skin. None of these bizarre ideas ever came to anything. During an autopsy, the red mark on his leg was examined and x-rayed, but there was no sign of any foreign material. 
but a sample of the mark was still taken to be tested at a lab for biological weapons. It was then that a very tiny pellet, only 1.7 millimeters long, was found hidden within the mark on his leg. By the time the pellet was examined, there was no sign of any poison left. Still, it was concluded that Markov had probably been poisoned with ricin. Markov was right. He'd been killed with an umbrella that was specially designed for unsuspecting assassinations and weaponized to shoot a pellet and administer poison. The pellet itself was designed to only release the poison once inserted inside a human body. How exactly? Well, the tiny pellet had two holes covered in a sugary substance that only melted at 99 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature of the human body. It was like something straight out of James Bond. Even with this knowledge, there would have been no chance to save Markov. At the time, there wasn't an antidote to ricin. But who had killed him? Three weeks before Markov died, something happened to another Bulgarian dissenter, Vladimir Kostov, who had been the former head of the Paris Bureau of the Bulgarian State Radio and TV Network. As he was leaving the Arc de Triomphe metro station, Kostov heard a loud noise and felt something sting his back. A pellet similar to the one found in Markov was quickly removed from Kostov's back. Luckily, he survived. Hearing about what happened to Kostov, there was some speculation that Markov had been assassinated by agents from the KGB or by some other secret agent or hitman. There have been countless suspects who fit these descriptions, but the identity of his assassin remained a mystery for years. Today, no one has ever been charged with Markov's death. Today's final case is the most unexpected of all as it concerns conspiracies at the highest levels of government. As well, it begins where most cases end. Rodrigo Rosenberg already knew that he was going to die, but he wasn't approaching old age or suffering from a terminal illness. No, in the spring of 2009, Rosenberg knew that his death was going to be gruesome and untimely. Rosenberg, a corporate and anti-corruption lawyer in Guatemala, knew that he was going to be assassinated. But here's the thing, there weren't any signs to anyone except Rosenberg that he would meet such a tragic end. And because of this, no one really took him seriously. Everything was going well for him. One thing that was concerning to him was the rampant violence that consumed Guatemala. For example, Guatemala City has been rated the third most dangerous city in the world. And if that isn't concerning enough, in Guatemala City, an estimated 98% of the murders are never solved, a fact that bothered Rosenberg. Around 2009, Rosenberg served as counsel for some of Guatemala's most powerful elites, and he believed he was going to be assassinated because of one of these cases. The case had involved Khalil Musa, a Lebanese immigrant who manufactured textiles and produced coffee. Because Musa was 76, his daughter Marjorie helped him manage his businesses. On April 14, 2009, the two were driving together when they stopped at a red light just outside their factory. A man behind them got out of his vehicle and approached them on the passenger side. As he neared, he pulled out a 9mm pistol and shot both Musa and Marjorie in the chest before escaping to a motorcycle where the driver was waiting. The brutally efficient shooting left both father and daughter dead. Rosenberg had been distraught over the news of the shooting which was surprising to those around him because he hardly worked with the Mooses and barely knew them. Well, that's what his friends thought at least. It turns out that Rosenberg and Marjorie had been having an affair and planned on getting married. He was mourning the death of a woman he loved. The Mooses shooting shocked more than just Rosenberg. Khalil Musa had known Guatemala's president, Alvaro Colom, and Marjorie was a good friend of Gustavo Aleos, Colom's private secretary. Those in Guatemala were terrified at the message the Musa's death sent. If friends of the president could be killed, then no one was truly safe. Rosenberg became obsessed with solving Marjorie's murder. His intense investigations led him into the subterranean world of Guatemalan politics. The more he dug into the case, the more concerned he became that he would be next. Rosenberg told friends he had started to receive death threats, that his apartment was under surveillance, and that he was sure he was being followed everywhere he went. On May 10, 2009, Rosenberg, an avid bike rider, took a ride around 8 a.m. Camera footage caught the terrifying moments that followed. As Rosenberg rode through a quiet tree-lined street, a Mazda is following close behind him. In seconds, Rosenberg is shot three times in the head, once in the neck and once in the back, 
and collapses off his bike where he bleeds out on the side of the street. The Mazda assassins fled from the scene. At Rosenberg's funeral, one of his close friends, Luis Mendezabo, handed out a 17-minute video to mourners. It had been filmed only four days prior. The video showed Rosenberg seated behind a desk. What Rosenberg said rocked the entire nation. The now dead man spoke posthumously and not only predicted his death, but named who he claimed to be his alleged killers. If you're listening to this, it's because I was murdered. He continued by naming the people who he alleged were responsible for his killing, President Alvaro Colom, his private secretary, and a businessman named Gregorio Valdez. The shocking video included other allegations, including high-level corruption at a government-run cooperative bank, including the involvement of President Colom. Rosenberg alleged that this discovery is what led to his death. Rosenberg then told Vice President Espada, whom he described as not a thief or an assassin, to take the presidency from Colom in order to ensure that the guilty would be delivered to justice. Only hours after the funeral, the video was uploaded to YouTube. It quickly went viral within Guatemala and crashed the servers because so many people were viewing it. As Rosenberg may have predicted, his video caused extreme tension in the government between the president and vice president who it seemed could be involved in a coup and between those who believe Rosenberg's claims and those who didn't. But the truth of it all was even more twisted. In January 2010, the truth of what actually happened finally came to light. As it turned out, shocking much of the country, President Colom had nothing to do with Rosenberg's death. Two brothers, Francisco Jose Valdez Pays and Jose Estuardo Valdez Pays, were accused of hiring hitmen after being asked to do so by none other than Rosenberg himself. The Pays brothers had been Rosenberg's cousins through his previous marriage and had allegedly agreed to find hitmen for Rosenberg after he told them he feared for his life. Rosenberg negotiated the specifics of the hit, telling the hitmen descriptions of what their target looked like and where he would be. He also paid the hitmen's fee of 300,000 quetzal. Rosenberg even went as far as to fabricate evidence, including buying two phones, one which he used to send himself threats and the other he used to contact the hitmen. The target he gave the hitmen was himself. Rosenberg then recorded his final video, blaming his death on the president, but Rosenberg had technically taken his own life. With this shocking revelation, more information about Colomb's state of mind was revealed. We already know he was mourning the loss of Marjorie, but his mother had also passed away. He was going through a second divorce, and his wife had moved his children to Mexico. Hearing the truth finally come to light, Colomb was publicly vindicated, though he said he had no rancor in his heart over the ordeal he went through at the hands of Rosenberg's manipulations. The real question that remains is, why Rosenberg had gone to such elaborate means to stage his death? Did he really want his death to spark reform that would end corruption in his country? Or was it all about revenge? Some suspect that Rosenberg believed Cologne may have been involved in Musa and Marjorie's deaths, though no connection has ever been proven. But this belief would explain why he had gone to such lengths to frame Cologne. However, we may never know the truth, so you can be the judge of that.